thank you and welcome to today's panel discussion, uh, UK stocks, what to do now and how to ensure success. My name's Emma and I'm here on the marketing team here at SafePass and the focus for today are the proposed uh, legislative changes for the UK corporate governance. So I'm delighted to be joined by four esteemed panelists today. Uh, we have Rem Normahamid, partner at Field Fisher. Um, Rem is a leading UK expert in the field of IT, IP, communications, privacy and cybersecurity law. Uh, he is also CIO and board member of a UK law firm. Uh, we're also joined by Adrian Rogers, who is Capability Lead, uh, Business Architecture and Compliance at Searchlight Consulting. Um, Adrian has helped deploy many transformation programs addressing control and compliance for leading organizations around the world. Uh, welcome to Nigel King. Um, Nigel is CEO of Software Strategy Tools and Consulting. He is IT lecturer at NTU and also former uh, VP at Oracle, who actually bought the first of the Oracle GRC products to market back when Sarbanes-Oxley was passed in the, in, the, um, in the US. And last but not least, Navinda Kaplesh, my colleague here at SafePass, uh, Client Services Director, Governance Risk and Compliance Specialist, who has worked on many complex GRC and SOX projects for leading organizations around the, around the world. Uh, we will have uh, time for some Q&A at the end of the session. Uh, so if you do have any questions, queries, feel free to pop those in the control panel and we'll get to those at the end of the, at the, end of the session. Um, and today's session will be recorded for, for on-demand viewing and, and reference. Uh, so let's dive right into the discussion, which is why you're all here today, which is why you've all joined us. So Adrian, I'm going to start with you. Um, can you provide some context around the legislation for our audience? Sure, thanks. Um, so I think it's important to put this in the context that corporate governance isn't new. It's been around since the early 90s. The Cabaret Committee, people might remember it from 91, 92. It was associated to major faders in Maxwell, BCCI, Polypec. And it was a um, set of recommendations that were adopted on an explain or uh, sorry, a comply or explain basis. And that's been running on and off in the UK now for a, a long period of time. However, the context and the landscape is changing and failures recently, such as Carillion, there have been question marks over the impartiality of audit, um, the short term nature of executive paid incentives, how that plays back into appropriate corporate governance. So in March 2021, the Department for Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy issued a white paper. And that white paper is a significant um, change proposal away around how corporate governance is going to be um, adopted in the UK and the changes to the audit sector. Now we're not looking at the audit sector here, we're talking about corporate governance and the paper concentrates on restoring trust in audit and corporate governance, that's its title. It sets out over a hundred recommendations and those recommendations focus on strengthening the regulatory enforcement and corporate governance. It's driving accountability and ownership back into the board, the CEO, CFO, and the wider board in general. It's also going to implement a framework of consequence where the <laughs> regulator has, in, has enforcement capability to uh, look at significant failures and then go for um, recovery. Now, they've also introduced the concept of something called a public interest entity. Now, that's a wide scope of organizations primarily you can think about it as the FTSE 350 organizations and significant private enterprises now while it's still being drafted the legislation is proposing that those um significant sized public interest entities let's say the FTSE 100 are going to be given something like 2023 to comply and then smaller organizations or if you like the wider scoped organizations will come in two years later now, what you will hear, this is often referred to as SOX 23, and that's because it's the UK adopting a very similar approach to the US. Uh, the US did this Arbanes Oxy program in the early 2000s off the back of the MCI and, and M Emron kind of failures. And the UK is now stepping into a similar agenda with this uh, proposal and this legislation to take its uh, way through Parliament in the moment. Um, hopefully that's uh, a bit of context given. Uh, yes, it has indeed, Adrian, but that kind of all sounds very 
very high level and to a certain extent we can say that we've been here before um, so why is it different this time round and what is likely to be the outcome of non-compliance um, perhaps Rem you'd like to to take this one sure thank you Emma <clears throat> as Nigel has indicated uh, the proposed reform under the government's white paper is based on a number of recommendations including those from the Bryden report and the Kingman Review. So we have to remember this is a fundamental overhaul and it will centre on scrutiny, accountability, transparency, and really raising the bar on what constitutes effective control and systems and management of risk and raises the impact and consequences for non-compliance. So what are these consequences? Well, these consequences will be addressed through regulatory measures spanning the areas of audit, corporate reporting and corporate governance. So what's the UK government planning to do now? Well, the UK government is proposing to introduce a new regulator called the Audit, Reporting and Governance Authority, or as I call it, ARGA, for, for ease of uh, reference. And ARGA really is intended to supersede the existing FRC. And the aim really will be to um, receive strategic direction from government, uh, be accountable to parliament, but actually will be funded uh, by means of a statutory levy uh, on the market participants, so effectively all the pies. So what is the scope of these increased powers, you're asking, and, and what will the regulator be granted through uh, new legislation? Well, at this stage, and simply by illustration, um, only because uh, we could be here for hours, but, but uh, in terms of a non-exhaustive li list to give you a flavour, the government is seeking to grant ARGA the power to impose sanctions and take enforcement actions against companies' pies, the power to require the pies to provide rapid, don't know what rapid is, but rapid explanations regarding its reporting or audit compliance, the power to publish its audit inspection reports on individual audits, and this is without the consent of the audit firm or the pie. It will also have the power to require an expert, person skilled, to review the pie's corporate reporting or audit where it has concerns, and where these concerns have been borne out uh, by the expert review, it will also have the right to publish summary findings uh, where it feels that this is in the public interest to do. So it's quite extensive. And then in terms of the corporate reporting review work, ARGA also will have the power uh, to direct changes to company reports and accounts. The regulator will no longer need to get a court order to do this, uh, as is the current case. So it can seek changes uh, on company reports and accounts without court order. The power it will have to publish summary findings and if necessary, uh, publish full correspondence following a corporate reporting review, uh, which again is a means of increasing transparency. Uh, the final example I've got is the power to extend the review process to, able, to enable ARGA to look into novel areas beyond where it currently looks. Uh, and these will extend to things like corporate governance statements, directors' remuneration and audit committee reports, the CEO reports, uh, as well as the chairman's reports. So in terms of takeaways for you, the mood music from the white paper is clear. Greater trust, accountability, transparency when it comes to audit, corporate reporting and corporate governance from pies. So with a proactive regulator armed with these extensive powers to enforce, Really, for all pies going forward, there will be little or no room to hide when it comes to non-compliance, particularly where such non-compliance arises from failures to employ effective, appropriate internal controls, systems and risk management in time. Emma. Uh, yes, thanks for that insight there, Rem. Um, both you and Adrian have spoken about the, the white paper and you've mentioned um, December 2023. Is that, a, is that a fixed date, Adrian? Can you share any light here? It's a fixed date as far as it's in the white paper. Um, the white paper obviously has to go through Parliament and it has to be approved and, and transferred into law. There is an expectation that significant public interest entities will be required to comply by December 2023. Okay, now that is subject to final drafting and uh, final approvals. But I think anybody who is interested in this area should focus on that December 23 date as being the deadline. And that isn't to be stop preparation, that is actually to be compliant with the requirement. 
the paper has, has indicated, as I said earlier, that there is a two-stage approach. So where the scope has been widened, then it's indicated in the paper that the, if you like, the widened scope, those companies will have a further two years potentially to get their compliance in place to meet the regulation. As I say, though, these are conditions, uh, a condition on the final legislation, but that's what the white paper is indicating at the moment. And it suggests that, you know, for significant public interest entities, there's a little over two years to actually start putting a change program in place to get all these things addressed to make sure they are compliant with the requirements. Okay, well, two years sounds quite a long time, but we all know that two years isn't really a long time at all. So, uh, Navinda, what can organisations be doing now to get a, to get ahead of the curve in preparation uh, for UK stocks? Thank you, Emma. So, uh, I mean, that's basically a, a, a question very much from a, a planning and hands-on perspective. I mean, from experience, I've helped uh, clients come up to speed um, and, and get socks ready. So, two years is not a long time at all. <laughs> um, if you're if you're in the PIE umbrella, you really need to start creating a roadmap right away um, and think about how you'll um, be ready for for this new legislation because a typical financial controls framework if you if you think about at a high level uh, it probably takes you about an year to identify the scope uh, scope in terms of applications which applications are in scope which processes are in scope um, and and then implement controls um, and it can take another another year almost probably maybe more depending on the complexity to actually embed those controls across the organization and in theory, that sounds very simple, but in reality, when you think about a company that's mature, maybe maybe across many entities, many, many countries, um, having to change processes, potentially change their operating model in certain areas, uh, maybe hire people, um, it, it's actually not, you know, it takes a lot of time. So um, about a year to plan your scope and design uh, roles, and then another year to embed them across the organization effectively. So you kind of, use the second year as a dry run. So yeah, two years is not a long time at all from that perspective. <laughs> no, absolutely not, no. But the, the message is very clear. It's gonna take time to address this. It's gonna be protected by, by law and it's also gonna be enforced by um, regulators. So um, earlier, Adrian, you referred to um, US Sarbanes-Oxley. So Nigel, I'm going to come to you here, given your experience um, with US SOX. Can any lessons be learned from this SOX experience uh, to help businesses adapt to these changes? And are they are they relevant? Uh, uh, thank you very much, Emma. Uh, well, I mean, if, if you go back to the, the very early days of uh, SOX, um, where, when, if you were to ask, you know, top executives about internal controls, their, their general response would have been, What's an internal control? In 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 fact, there, there was a, um, a a very notable moment with with the president of uh, 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 with the president of Enron on the stand uh, uh, when when he was uh, when he was being questioned about internal controls, and he actually stated that that it was uh, unreasonable for for him to be expected to know the state of their internal controls, which I think is one of the things that really led to the content of Sarbanes Oxley. Yeah, sorry, and if I could just come in there, then I think this links back directly to the proposals in the white paper from those kind of statements. And directors, primarily CEOs, CFOs, but also collective board, are going to have to provide written assurances on the effectiveness of those controls underpinning their financial reports. And that assurance has to be against a benchmark system, which also shows the effectiveness of the assurance and uh, of, of those statements. So I think that kind of correlates back to that period. If, is that correct? Oh yeah, I mean, abs um, absolutely. I mean, it's obviously a, a key requirement that was uh, that was driven by by SOX. And at the in the early days, there were there was uh, you know huge in, in investment in trying to trying to grapple with how to respond uh, to the need to sort of uh, uh, make an assessment on a compliance and governance framework. So the, the, like right at the start of, of SOX, it was really the internal auditors that were that were heavily involved. As they really held, they really held the knowledge base of what internal controls were, what risk management was. Uh, it really sits with that, uh, sits with that, with that profession. But of course, bringing internal auditors into that much assistant with with 
um, uh, that much assistance with like, management blurred the lines really of what auditors were supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be independent from uh, really independent from management and have a much stronger line up to the audit committee. So one of the reactions was to to um, to appoint process owners that would be the czar of each process and to to start up a SOX program uh, uh, to start up a SOX program office um, so that the internal auditors could remain independent from management. Uh, well, one, one area that that was really highlighted is in those in those early days was during the 90s, like loads of companies had actually outsourced a whole bunch of operations. And now a lot of the internal controls on which you relied were actually being run by other companies. Um, and you, you, you had to get some understanding of the state of those internal controls in your outsourcing partners. Um, that, that gave rise to a number of other auditing standards like SOC 1 and SOC 2. And so we, we would expect that 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 need to confirm internal controls right the way through an extended process chain would be something that, that we would expect to happen in the UK as well. Um, back to you, Emma. Yep, thanks for that, Nigel. Um, and before we carry on, we have alluded to accountability. Um, so what about the accountability of um, directors? What's the, the consequence of non-compliance? From a legal perspective, uh, Rem, maybe you can take this one coming from a legal background. Yes, thank, you. thank you, Emma, uh, and I think it is an important question. We've talked about uh, consequences at a corporate level, but uh, in terms of accountability uh, of directors, I mean, the white paper makes it very clear uh, that directors in a key management position will be held to greater account, uh, and that's clearly following significant corporate collapses, which uh, you know we've alluded to uh, uh, earlier on. Um, again, uh, how will this be uh, enforced? Well, this comes back down to ARGA, the regulator. Uh, and again, ARGA will be given powers to investigate and enforce sanctions against directors for breach of their duties regarding corporate reporting and audit. Again, this is over and above existing powers of other enforcement agencies. So, for example, in addition to the powers uh, exercised by ARGA, it could well be, for example, that the insolvency service uh, still uh, decides to bring an action against the director for, uh, you know, director's disqualification proceedings. So these things are cumulative uh, and not uh, mutually exclusive. In terms of executive director's remuneration, you know, where's it going to hit you? Um, uh, there will be um, additional um, uh, sanctions that will be in uh, put in place by ARGA. Uh, and there is something called a mandatory malice, or in other words, withholding of pending awards uh, and the right to claw back uh, monies uh, under the terms of the uh, revised uh, contractual arrangements with directors of service contracts. So the, the uh, regulator will have uh, the opportunity to look at withholding and or claw back uh, and there will be a default minimum term uh, that will apply uh, and this will be um, a two-year window following award. Uh, and when we talk about uh, the triggers uh, within the period, we're really talking about triggers for serious misconduct, uh, material misstatement for results, or er errors in performance calculations, uh, and or potentially failures uh, of internal controls and risk management. So again, at the hands of the directors, what has happened, uh, what has gone wrong, uh, and in terms of accountability, uh, what has failed? I mean, those are the things that the regulator will be very keen to uh, to look at. Um, now, in terms of how these are going to be implemented, well, the reality is that these changes, uh, it's contemplated that these changes will come into effect via the UK Corporate Governance Codes. I mean, the sanctions for directors, uh, just to, to finish on this point, uh, isn't absolute. I mean, there are other proposals, and, and worth noting that other proposals are suggesting uh, that ARGA also have the power to impose detailed requirements and even behavioural standards on directors, uh, for example, honesty and integrity, or where they feel the directors need to comply with existing corporate reporting and audit duties, or provide that directors will be liable uh, to civil enforcement actions for breach of such requirements. So it's pretty extensive and far more so than, than we've seen to date. So, you know, this is about driving uh, public confidence. Emma. Absolutely. Excellent insight there. Thanks, Rem. Um, and moving on, um, in the panel's experience, how can companies build 
build the approach. So what tools exist to help meet compliance um, requirements and timelines? Navinda, perhaps you can share yeah. some. Yeah. Um, so Emma, I mean, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about an approach that can be taken because um, lots of our attendees probably work, work for UK companies that might be impacted by this maybe smaller companies and larger companies as well it's, it's, it's a new thing so um, from experience i mean an approach uh, that could be taken to prepare um, i think the most important thing is you need to have senior management buy-in um, rem talked about the impact on directors if if, if there are issues and really th this has to be um, a top-down approach whereby the company decides yep we need to be SOX compliant um, by 2023 or 2024, or if the target is later on. Um, and the FDs, the CIOs, the audit committee especially, if they, if they have an audit committee, uh, should really uh, make that a major objective in the organization and drive it down uh, from, from the top. Because let's face it, um, regulatory work, controls, um, these aren't exactly very sexy areas where people wake up in the morning and you know, somebody who's doing an accounts payable um, manager job thinks I'm going to do great controls today. I mean, it's basically something that uh, we need to make sure that um, you, you obviously we need to make it easy for people to, 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 to follow and uh, implement those controls. But really, it needs to have senior management uh, drive um, to make sure folks do it. Um, also, the second thing I'd recommend is really we need to beef up the finance and IT functions. I mean, from experience, the whole the whole idea, the whole concept Around, around SOX is to make sure you have strong controls um, wherever the business has an impact from an internal, you know, ICFR is used as a terminology. So internal controls or financial reporting. So whichever process or system eventually impacts your financial reporting, um, it needs to have needs to have good controls. And so the, the main teams that end up getting impacted from experience are the finance and IT functions. You might have a new working model whereby uh, you have global process owners, you might have regional process owners, accountability, there might be higher accountability on IT uh, functions where they manage uh, systems or support systems today, where there's um, an impact on financial reporting. So based on, if, you, if, if an organization is not prepared or not mature in terms of uh, SOX controls, this can be actually quite a significant um, shift in the way of working for certain areas. So really, Step number two I'd recommend is really beefing up the finance and IT functions with that vision. Um, step number three, I guess, is probably the most uh, most important step in terms of implementing SOX controls. I mean, this is basically scoping. So if you think about what eventually impacts your financial statements, there has to be some hard analysis done around which processes and systems um, impact, have, an, have a material impact on your financial statements. And you need to sort of work with your internal auditors, work with external auditors, and any other specialists you have on board. You'll end up focusing on critical financial applications like ERP systems, the oracles and SAPs of the world. You'll end up focusing on billing systems and uh, finance reporting systems, et cetera. But really, you're looking at trying to define, taking a top-down view and seeing what should be in scope. And this is a really important step because um, what can happen is if you miss an important application from at the start, uh, it'll come back and bite you because you need to rethink how you perform controls and how you how you structure processes for that application. Um, and actually, when SOX came in 18, 20 years ago in the US, in in comparison to that, uh, there are there are advantages of of where we are today in the sense that there are many governance and compliance tools, um, various types of GRC tools. So technology should really be used to make your life easier. So once as a business you've decided these are the systems and processes and scope, if you have very manual ways of working, uh, then really you should consider specialist tools um, whereby you you implement uh, controls via specialist GRC tools. I mean, SafePass has uh, functionality specifically around ERP systems where you look at where you look at certain IT controls, segregation duties, et cetera. Uh, it'll, save, it'll save clients a hell of a lot of time if you implement tools which automate controls uh, as opposed to doing it manually and finally um, auditors really really look um, for evidence so in the in the u.s there's a state called missouri and they call it the show me state because apparently folks there believe in hard evidence 
um, auditors are very much like that. I think it isn't good enough to say, oh, I know, I know Paul in accounting. He's been here 25 years, a very trustworthy person. If he has that access, he won't do anything with it. Auditors will need to see hard evidence. So everything that you implement when we talked earlier about scoping and GRC tools, whatever controls are actually implemented, you need to make sure we can evidence um, that the control requirements are being met uh, and the evidence has to be you know, paper-based or, or electronic. So the, the mindset shift that you require for being very evidence-based uh, is, is actually a huge, huge cultural shift in company. I've seen clients struggle with that. Um, and that's where it gets the name that it's slightly bureaucratic, but so um, that's, that's the overall approach I take. Senior management buy-in, beefing up finance and IT functions, scoping correctly, uh, investing in the correct technology tools, and then focusing very hard on evidence. Yeah, thanks, Navinda, for that great insight. And you mentioned the, the Missouri state, so going back to the, the US, uh, what approach did US SOCs have, Nigel? Um, so I, I, I think as, as we saw SOCs develop, uh, or the response to SOCs develop, it, there, there were some, some distinct phases that it, it kind of went through. Um, fa phase one was, was uh, you know, out of the gate, uh, there was a big focus on procedure manuals. And I think this was largely due to the way that internal auditors work, because they really look for internal controls by reviewing a flowchart or some representation of a process and run through with a highlight pen and highlight the control activities. So that, that kind of caused an explosion in the creation of procedures manuals so that people can actually say how a process was performed. Um, and at that point in time, content management software became very, very popular. That kind of transitioned onto, onto phase two which was kind of a focus on key controls. So now that we've gone through the procedure manuals phase, we had a, a sea of control activities, and it was it was pretty expensive to sign off all of the uh, to, to sign off all of the controls. So there was a there was a focus on finding out what the key controls are, and and the closed process was like first amongst those key controls, really. So software that that was founded on workflow management became very popular just to understand how the closed process was working. Uh, phase three was kind of a focus on IT general controls. So there seemed in the third phase to be a realization that processes that were automated were just more reliable and easier to control. And that setting up those controls correctly would be a really valuable exercise. So there was a lot of, um, uh, um, a lot of software got sold that was based on configuration management and setting configurations correctly. So that, that became very popular. Um, phase four was kind of a focus on access controls. So as those IT general controls kind of got stabilized, there was a focus on uh, cleaning up inappropriate access controls that tend to accumulate in the enterprise system. So if you've been running a system for 10 years, that you've generally got, you know, nine years worth of inappropriate access that you're currently using. So, you know, segregation of duties software became very popular at that, at, at that, at that phase. And then fa the, the phase five, I think, which is kind of the, 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 the final phase really for the, that I was, uh, um, I was aware of, uh, moved back a little bit towards the traditional operational uh, um, and financial audit. Uh, that those, those types of audits had sort of taken a back seat through some of the earlier phases, but, but came back to the fore with the re-emergence of transaction monitoring capabilities. Um, and, and this made analytics software you know, very, very popular at that, at that phase. Uh, you know, if, if there's any it's a lesson that, that we can take away from having watched those phases turn in the United States. It was that there was a great temptation to get busy rather than think. Um, and the, the, cre the, 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 key, um, the key section in Sarbanes-Oxley that caused all of that activity was section 404, which was very explicitly worded around internal controls over financial reporting. So, I, you know, think long and hard about where the risks for financial misstatement are before you get busy and, and choose the appropriate tools that address the, those, those risks. 
Yeah, uh, thanks for that great insight there, Nigel. And what about you, Adrian? Do you want to add anything here? Yeah, thanks, Emma. I think it's, um, I, I'm going to echo a lot of what um, Nav and Nigel have both said, but I think it's really, really important um, that this isn't viewed as being a negative bureaucratic exercise. Yeah, you know, the change is coming. It is going to be mandated. Um, there's not going to be a choice between compliance and non-compliance. You need to comply. But I think the change can also be viewed as positive. It's going to um, provide surety over financial reporting. It's going to give market certainty over robustness of numbers. That adds to reputational uh, enhances things like the company's reputation in the marketplace. So adoption of a robust benchmark framework, you know, giving you um, fantastic kind of visibility of your numbers to the city or your investors can only help the business overall and you know what I would say is again echoing both nines and nav is don't try and bore the ocean you need to assess what the control framework is you have today the adequacy of that control framework versus the changes that are going to come through to the white paper and then plan appropriately on what you need to focus on to get compliant. And that doesn't mean everything. Yeah, you know, you've got to look at where the risk factor is for your organizations and put a roadmap in place that allows you to um, evolve and develop a, a kind of framework that allows you to meet that regulatory requirement. I mean, it will touch back again to as I said what the other guys have said, but you know, the complexity of integrations, you you know, organizations evolve over time. And whilst you have the ERP in the center of the in the center of this, you'll have third party systems that integrate into the ERP, maybe for revenue, maybe for cost, maybe for property management. How are those, how are those being managed? Where's the, the control and robustness in the completeness and accuracy of those data of those data sets? Where's the evidence that that is being managed and controlled if it has a significant impact on your reporting numbers? Access and joiners, levers, movers, again, another key area of risk for organizations, automation, of those processes, constant review of those processes, assurance that they are being adhered to and therefore people only have the relevant access to their jobs and it's not creating segregation of duty conflicts. Also where you're working with third parties, you know, get a catalogue where your third party provider who hold your data outside of your organisation with some element of control over it because they will need to give you some assurances. It, it loops back to the SOC 1, SOC 2 conversation earlier. Where that data resides outside of your organization, you need to have assurance that those organizations have compliance so you can place reliance on them. And if you carry on, then you know, it, it's again, how do you get this? You need to invest in resources. IT and finance in particular, as NAV says, you need to work with partners who can help build those roadmaps, help streamline that to make sure you're focusing on the right risks. Also invest in the technology tools where necessary so you can automate as much as possible. Back to Nav's point, the more automation you can get into this, the less manual risk you have, the less failure you have in terms of uh, manual failure, process controls. But really, really comes back to what I said, uh, understand where you are and define what you need to do, where you need to get to, to get into that compliant framework. So you're not trying to solve every problem if it's not relevant to that, to, to what you need to achieve in the context of the white paper and the legislation. Yeah, Except thanks for, for yeah, thanks for that, um, Adrian. So we all seem pretty aligned on the steps that organisations need to be taking. Rem, do you want to add any last thoughts here? Well, I mean, I think it's all been said, and I'm not going to be the classic lawyer with a broken record around uh, stick and carrot around the legislative or regulatory landscape. I mean, we know it's coming. Uh, and I think, you know, as the guys have said, we know what's gone before in the US. So, so let's learn uh, from there and leapfrog moving forward. Uh, I think all I conclude with is to say, be strategic, start with the end in mind, work smarter, plan, plan now, you have time to plan. So the key thing is to plan and use that time wisely. Uh, it will be about efficiency and effectiveness. Ultimately, the key thing for uh, all pies uh, it's about driving uh, business value and brand value. It's about reputation, public confidence, uh, and clearly trying to run across uh, the powers of the regulator is not necessarily a clever or a powerful uh, move for you. So use the time wisely, is all I'd say. 
Absolutely. Well, we are um, on time, so we do have some time for some Q&A and we've had some great questions come in. So uh, first question from Martin here. Would you mind reiterating the dates of the rollout and provide some additional clarity on what constitutes as a public interest entity? So I'll try and take okay. that if I can. So the public interest entity is anything that would cause a disruption in the UK market if there's a failure or a breach. Now it's a pretty wide reaching definition. Um, they tend to cover, they tend to put it into the context of a FTSE 350 and they are and then they extend it slightly to a significant private enterprises, so privately owned businesses. Now the scope of that of that public interest entity is um, what determines the time frame. So if you're deemed to be significant, and let's say for argument, you know, for simplicity, that's say FTSE 100, then your time frame is looking like December 2023. If you sit outside of what they're calling significant in the white paper, then they are potentially talking about a further two years, which will take you to 2025 for compliance. But you know, the, the definition, is pretty broad it's pretty encompassing they're trying to get as many organizations as possible within that context and definition i think rem i don't know if you've got anything further on that to add any clarity no i, I think um i think that is uh, pretty clear actually so um you know for those in growth phase and those that um are looking to uh, acquire or grow in the other way organically i think actually look at your own projections and where you think may, you may be landing in year two to year three uh, and you know use that also as a yardstick around your own readiness um, because ultimately uh, it will be a fairly rude awakening if you uh, plan for four years and find that you've got there sooner than that so i, I think Nigel, i think you've got that adrian uh, fairly well defined thanks Yep, we hope that's answered your question, Martin, and I think we answered that for, for Stephen as well. Um, next question from Mike, uh, who says, in the in the US, the internal, the external auditor, sorry, is required to provide assurance on management report on internal controls. In the proposed legislation, it appears that this may not necessarily be the case in the UK. Anyone like to take that question? I mean, I think what I would add is that there are greater following the two papers of Bryden and Kingman, um, there will be increased accountability on, on auditors uh, from an external audit function. So uh, the Argo will have uh, the ability and the powers to actually look at what's happened from an external audit perspective and, and the, the standards and the quality that, um, you know, have, have been employed in that uh, review and, and that audit reporting. So I think there will be um, uh, visibility and transparency and uh, performance obligations placed upon and standards placed upon uh, the external auditors, but also uh, within the internal audit function, because at the end of the day, uh, as um, directors sign uh, these things off and have significant uh, management control and function, clearly they will become uh, equally accountable. Okay, thanks for that, Ram. Uh, I think so. just, to add, I think, just to add on that, I think it is, the paper, I think, isn't explicit this yet, mm -hmm. and what the role of external auditors are yet in, in the audit of those uh, com corporate controls that are going to come through. So I th it's unknown at this stage what they're going to ask auditors to do. And so I think, you know, we've got to wait and see as that evolves. But I, I would imagine that if you're the audit practice, you're going to be quite interested in your internal management controls and, and controls framework but we have to see what happens i think um and my fact if i can add something to that as well so what rem and adrian have said um i think we've got to zoom out and think about the big picture um this regulation is being driven because of failures like carillion patisserie valerie and other prominent ones we've of course had the recent case not so recent now but recent case of fairly recent case of wirecard where the external auditors big four uh, one of the big fours were very much in the spotlight um, so even if at the end of this 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 process if uh, there is slight difference with the between the us and the uk SOX uh, models from an auditor perspective i think the direction of travel is clear that there's greater accountability coming for auditors and for directors and you don't want any public you know massive public um, issues like the wirecard one which was pretty bad so I think I'd like to think that the auditors would themselves force a higher standard, even if something that, that is different, slightly weaker than this. 
I, I think to to uh, to add add to, to that, like for uh, when 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 Enron hit, there were obviously the big five, and now there's the big four. So there's certainly impact on the audit profession. Uh, there's a lot of divestments that happened for the auditors to get rid of the businesses that caused conflict of interest for them. Um, so so you know, m most of them got rid of their consulting businesses um, and and to, to re remove some of the conflict of interest and 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 you know that was certainly written into 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 socks that you, you you couldn't be both having consulting services as as well as being the audit provider for a given for a given company and then on the on the sort of side of the actual business itself I mean what one of the things that that socks did is it made directors themselves liable rather than the company being liable so that was a really big shift that that you know if you were caught destroying records you yourself were actually liable it wasn't the company that was the, the, that was uh, it wasn't the company that was liable that that was a, a very big shift in the in that accountability that um that companies had for truthful for truthful reporting uh scrolling through the questions here okay if the organization already complies with us SOX requirements will it have to comply with uk requirements as well or will there be exceptions um I'll, I'll, start on, I'll start on that one i mean i guess obviously we've got a white paper we haven't actually got the legislation um but i i, I would imagine the principles are going to align um but i would also uh based on reality, the UK will enforce its own position in relation to its own standards and how it wishes uh, compliance to be. So I think there will be parallels, but uh, I suspect um, in order for there to be compliance, it would be uh, both US and UK, um, but I can't see that they would be so far apart that actually it increases the burden on, on the corporate environment. So, you know, from a principles point of view, they should be same or similar. How the UK um, invokes the white paper into uh, an enactment uh, legislation, obviously it's yet to be seen. Okay. Um, Artie asks, um, any changes how internal audit departments um, um, yes, okay, so should they change the way they approach things? Uh, what do you see are the changes in the internal audit departments? Um, I, can, I can take a shot at that. I mean, I guess in terms of change, um, generally internal audit departments, they have an audit plan for the year and they have sort of, you know, uh, areas they focus on uh, that they, they scope out. And I suspect if your company suddenly decides that actually we need to be UK SOX compliant and the controls maturity has to change, then I guess from an internal audit perspective, your your focus will probably change to um, systems like ERP systems and other financial reporting systems that are definitely going to be in store uh, for, for UK SOX. And maybe you have to do a bit more there in the coming years as opposed to other areas which probably are not UK SOX compliant. So that's a simple, um, I guess, change of focus in the business translating to change of focus for internal IT that I can, IT that I can, uh, sorry, internal audit that I can perceive. And I mean, internal audit is third, you know, third line of defense typically. Uh, they have a very important role in the organization. Um, and, and it's very, if a strong internal audit team can really make the SOX journey um, easier and smoother because they can challenge the business to improve um, much earlier than, than the external auditors get anywhere close to those controls. So I guess from that perspective, it's quite an important um, area. And they might also serve to inform the risk model that you need to develop based on their experience within that organization as well. So they have, you know, they're embedded in the organization, they have that independence and they, will, they might have the wider view of actually where some of the relevant risks are that sit within this new legislation as it emerges. So they can inform and help shape it, but they have to retain their independence as we alluded to earlier. They can't become the leaders in in the reporting piece. They have to be the independent body behind it. I guess just to add to that, we don't know how corporates will respond and, and whether the internal audit function will become uh, clearly less, uh, will become more uh, risk averse, uh, given given the consequences of um, 
what will happen. So I think it'll be very interesting to see how the dynamics there develop uh, based on the final position on, on the legislation. But again, we're still waiting in the reality now, we're still waiting for the responses to be processed by uh, the government following the consultation. Uh, and clearly we're all interested to see uh, what, it, uh, what the outcomes are following the responses from industry. But I, I think we, we can we can certainly see that there's there's going to be a, a skills shortage in that in that skill set that the the SOX model the skill set aligned more to the skills of an internal auditor than it did to an external auditor. So I, I expect that those people are going to get pretty scarce quite quickly. Yeah. Okay. Let's squeeze in one more. Um, can you give us some guidance on what is a good control? Nigel? Uh, what, one that gives you increased surety over the accuracy of financial reporting, clearly for, for, for SOX, the, the focus was on financial reporting. So things, those, those, those controls that give you a higher degree of confidence that you're reporting accurate numbers in a timely manner um, would, be a, would be a good control. Uh, um, Emma, I can be I can be more specific. If you want me to give us a more specific example, like I can probably give it a shot. It's a very open-ended question. It's um, I think Nigel's answered it really well from a perspective of a concept. And I think if you take a step back, if you're not from a controls background, I, I think you need to think about the activity that's being performed or the area that you're looking at. Does that have an impact on um, any kind of misrepresentation of accounting information? So, for example, can you go in and modify things in the system, covering up your tracks and, for example, showing a much higher revenue than, than, than is real or, or you know, uh, manipulating numbers. So that's one area, misrepresentation of information. And the other main area generally tends to be um, fraud or, you know, financial leakage. So if, for example, you know, from, from a safe pass perspective, you always have tools. We have tools for segregation of duties. And a popular example is if you have access to create supplier bank accounts and then you have access to um you know process accounts payables invoices and you can set up your brother-in-law as your you know as a, as a supplier and then process invoices on that for that particular supplier thereby causing you know financial leakage in the organization that's another specific example of a control that's popular so if you think of those two areas generally and how that impacts your, your financial reporting eventually i think that's kind of hopefully that answers the question thanks now uh, we no, have had many if i could just add Sorry. on that though i think the one that you'll hear a lot is completeness and accuracy it's a massive kind of thing that comes through socks all the time that you've got completeness and accuracy of your data so if it left system a it arrives in system b it's complete it's accurate it's it has transformed or completed its journey as planned so you're actual to your planned and accountants you know reconciliation controls balance sheet controls, debtor control, creditors control, with evidence to source is, a, is you can't get away from it. That is fundamentally audit and um, data being attested that it, it is true to the source it came from. And that completes an accuracy is, is something that will just become more and more and more um, overriding throughout, throughout these journeys. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, we have had lots of other questions come in, but I'm afraid we've run out of time. So if we haven't answered your question, then we will um, answer in a follow-up email, um, either later today or during the week. So don't worry, we will get to your questions. Um, so I'm sure you'll all agree the session has been um, invaluable. So on behalf of everybody, a big thank you to everybody for attending and to our panelists for joining us today. Um, as a follow-up, we have um, put together a questionnaire um, entitled, How Mature Are Your Compliance and Control Processes? Uh, which we'll be sending out after the webinar so you can find out exactly where you are on your, on your journey. And then based on that output from the questionnaire, you can then take advantage of the SafePass Risk Management Platform to run um, 50 segregation of duty controls to identify um, the effectiveness, effectiveness of your current controls to identify any gaps that you may have you know, around IT controls in key financial systems. So a big thank you to you, Nigel, uh, Adrian, Rem, and Navinda. Um, and a big thank you to everybody for joining us today.
So thank you and have a great day. Thank you, Emma. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.